Thank you, Sammy. That was an outstanding talk. And as you can tell, this is really a watershed area, era. Many of you probably thought you might retire before you saw the real cure of hepatitis C. Our next speaker is Dr. Stephen Hahn. He's director of Hepatology Clinical Research Center, an active member in the NIH's Hepatitis B Clinical Research Program. He works in transplant. He teaches medical students, residents, and the rest of us about hepatitis B and cirrhosis. And uh, he's going to speak to us now about that. Thank you very much, Steve. Thank you. I'd like to uh, thank the course directors for inviting me to come speak today. Uh, we're going to talk about cirrhosis today, since Dr. Tong gave my usual lecture. Um, don't worry, there are 70 slides. They're there for your information, but I'm just going to hit the highlights, so just about 65 of them or so. Um, you know, cirrhosis is a, a worldwide problem, and it's estimated that uh, many millions are uh, histologically cirrhotic and don't even know it here in the U.S. I bet with uh, fatty liver disease, it's probably even more. Cirrhosis is a clinical diagnosis, so we don't need a liver biopsy. Um, we teach the fellows, if you can feel a flippable liver edge, that's good. If they have a low platelet count, that's pretty good. Nodular liver surface on imaging, that's pretty good. Endoscopic findings of portal hypertension, that's pretty good. So um, it's really a clinical diagnosis, and uh, we should probably be spending more time with the physical exams, looking for those spiders, the palmar erythema, the asterixis if they have the hepatic encephalopathy. Clearly, if someone comes in with ascites like this, gynecomastia, pitting edema, these are all signs of chronic liver disease and cirrhosis. So if you look at the whole picture, um, cirrhosis uh, can be diagnosed uh, without a liver biopsy. So there are many causes of cirrhosis, as we know. Um, as Sammy pointed out, hepatitis C is probably going to be a curable disease in a very easy treatment regimen in the near future. Hepatitis B, we're still working on cure, but I think we're going to get there. Uh, Non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, that's the big one. And I think we're going to see, uh, this is the new uncharted territory. We're going to see a lot more liver disease, a lot more cirrhosis from fatty liver disease. Once a patient has cirrhosis, they're on a slippery slope. And over the course of time, a proportion of patients with compensated cirrhosis go on to de develop decompensated cirrhosis. And the median survival time after developing decompensation uh, can be as short as two years. And these patients will ultimately die of something liver-related, hepatorenal syndrome, sepsis, a variceal hemorrhage, or worst case scenario, liver cancer. So how do we quantify cirrhosis? Um, this is something that you're all familiar with, the child Pew score. Uh, and it basically takes uh, criteria, two of which are clinical subjective criteria, three of which are objective laboratory criteria. You assign points, and based on the points, they're classified as childs A, B, or C. And for the most part, we consider B and C to be decompensated. Well, child Pew score has slowly been replaced by the MELD score which took away any subjectivity. And so now it's all uh, objective laboratory data, bilirubin, creatinine, protime, INR. You plug it into this formula, which is now available as a web calculator, so it's very easy to do, and you get a score based from 6 to 40, which kind of predicts the uh, survival rate for these patients. And so now MELD score is pretty much replace child Pew score as a way of quantifying decompensated liver disease. So what is decompensated cirrhosis? It's a patient with cirrhosis who has developed complications of portal hypertension. And these are listed here, the main ones being ascites, uh, variceal hemorrhage, portosystemic encephalopathy. So all the problems that come about from cirrhosis really stem from portal hypertension. 
Increased resistance to flow, increased splanchnic blood flow leads to increased portal pressures. And the increased portal pressures are what cause the varices, the ascites, the enlarged spleen, the hepatic encephalopathy. So let's go through each of these very briefly and I'll point out the major issues. These are all familiar with many of you and obviously things that we don't like to see endoscopically. Varices are present in at least half of cirrhotics and the sicker the patient is, the more prevalent the uh, varices are. So up to 85% of patients with child C cirrhosis will have varices. And the problem is if a patient doesn't have varices, they have an 8% per year chance of developing varices. And if they have small varices, they have an 8% per year chance of developing large varices. So it's a dynamic process. And these varices can bleed up to 15% per year. And as we know, the greatest predictor for bleeding is the size and also the degree of severity of the cirrhosis. So child's B and C patients bleed more often. And if they have endoscopic signs of bleeding, um, they have a higher risk. And obviously, in a patient who's bled, the mortality rates are high. So endoscopic screening in our cirrhotic patients is mandatory. <clears throat> and this is um, from the portal hypertension guidelines. Obviously, if the patient has no varices, there's not much you need to do, but you gotta keep screening them at least one to three years because, as I mentioned, it's a dynamic process. If they have small varices, we should beta block them. If they have medium to large varices, we beta block them or we ban them, depending on how severe their disease is. Patients bleed, and when they bleed, uh, for us, it's really probably a very uh, significant and emergent situation. So these patients should be placed in an ICU setting for resuscitation and management. And first off, we need to intravascularly replete them, transfuse them as needed, and please don't forget antibiotic prophylaxis. I can't tell you how many times this uh, isn't done. Uh, somatostatin can be added, and obviously they need to be scoped within 12 hours. Obviously, in patients who fail medical or endoscopic therapy, we have TIPS as a uh, salvage therapy. Uh, we used to use balloon tamponade, uh, but this is only temporizing. It doesn't replace any type of uh, other medical therapy. So why the prophylactic antibiotics? Because variceal bleeding is a risk factor for all sorts of infections, from SBP to pneumonias to bacteremias. And if these patients develop infection, uh, uh, their mortality rate is very high. The morbidity is very high as far as uh, failure to stop bleeding, early re-bleeding, and, and mortality up to 40%. So we can't just wait for the infection to start. Uh, the minute they walk in the door with a GI bleed, they need to be started on uh, antibiotic prophylaxis right away. And if you do this, you'll decrease the infection rate. You'll decrease the re-bleeding rate. As you can see here, prophylactic antibiotics are much better than on-demand antibiotics. So we shouldn't wait for the infection as soon as they hit the door, we start the antibiotics. Their transfusion requirements and re-bleeding risk will go down just treating with antibiotics. A little bit about burrito, we call it, a balloon retrograde transvenous obliteration. Uh, typically, gastric varices are difficult to treat. Gastric varices come from the gastric renal splenic collaterals you see there. And it's the retrograde flow due to portal hypertension that supplies these gastric varices. So in the burrito procedure, our interventional radiologists go in through the femoral vein, up through the left renal vein, into the gastric uh, renal splenic collateral, and occlude it with a balloon, 
and then sclerosis, uh, inject sclerosin. And what that does is it effectively sclerosis off the gastric varix. And this works really well. After the burrito procedure, we see in these four studies significant eradication of gastric varices. We see marked shrinkage of gastric varices. But there's never a free lunch because the burrito procedure doesn't eliminate portal hypertension. It only redistributes it. So despite uh, improvement in gastric varics, we do see occurrence of new esophageal varices. We see increase in size of existing esophageal varices. We've had uh, ascites develop, right hydrothorax develop. So burrito procedure is good, but you have to be aware of the complications. Typically, we sometimes even have to do a TIPS post-burrito uh, because of this increased portal hypertension. Ascites is the most common complication of cirrhosis. 60% uh, of patients with compensated cirrhosis will develop ascites. Once you develop ascites, the mortality rate is high. And you can see here that once ascites develops, survival decreases over, over the course of time. When a patient presents with ascites, uh, we can't stress the importance enough of doing an initial diagnostic paracentesis, and we need to characterize the ascites. We need to show that it is portal hypertensive. We need to get the total protein. These other uh, tests are optional, but uh, uh, can be helpful. And the management of ascites, first-line therapy, sodium restriction, diuretics, we use, to light, uh, we use uh, furosemide and spironolactone, and we uh, stepwise increase it according to renal function and diuresis. If a patient adheres to these, uh, most patients, 90% can be treated successfully. Only 10% have truly refractory ascites. And if they do have refractory ascites, our second-line therapies include large volume paracentesis, TIPS, but ultimately liver transplant. SBP, a major problem. It's diagnosed by a positive ascites culture or an absolute neutrophil count above 250. Secondary bacterial peritonitis is also very uh, significant. The main difference between secondary and spontaneous or primary bacterial peritonitis is that secondary is usually due to some intra-abdominal pathology and it's usually multi-organism. We need to treat patients prophylactically for SBP. Uh, these are the drugs that we typically use. And who are the acidic patients that we should be treating? Those that have a low ascites total protein. Lower total protein means lower opsonic function, lower protection. So these patients need to be treated. Again, the importance of getting that initial diagnostic paracentesis. Renal dysfunction and cirrhosis, a major problem. You can see most times patients are hospitalized for acute renal failure. 68% of these are due to pre-renal causes, and so we need to volume replete our patients. The diagnosis of hepatorenal syndrome is a diagnosis of exclusion. You can't diagnose hepatorenal syndrome until the patient has been shown to fail adequate volume repletion. But you can see here that renal function in the background of cirrhosis is bad news. The worse the creatinine, the worse the prognosis. And on the right, if a patient truly has hepatorenal syndrome, that portends a very, very poor prognosis. So acute renal failure in cirrhosis, very important to volume replete them, avoid nephrotoxics, treat their hemodynamics aggressively, um, if after all of these, they continue to have renal uh, failure, that portends hepatorenal syndrome, which, as I mentioned, is usually a death sentence. Once you diagnose hepatorenal syndrome without transplant, that patient will do very, very poorly. The median survival after the diagnosis of hepatorenal syndrome is usually three months, 
It's even lower in patients with severe decompensated cirrhosis and a high MELD score. There's two types of hepatorenal syndrome, the classic type, which is the rapidly aggressive type, but then there is a chronic insidious type of hepatorenal syndrome, type 2, where the patients usually have chronic uh, renal failure, and ultimately their prognosis is the same. Hepatic encephalopathy, probably the most uh, prevalent complication of portal hypertension. This was a critical care study. You can see 41% of the portal hypertensive problems were all due to encephalopathy. There's two types of hepatic encephalopathy, overt hepatic encephalopathy and minimal hepatic encephalopathy. They can affect uh, cirrhotic patients equally. So, Overt hepatic encephalopathy is diagnosed based on the distinctive neurologic features in a patient with known cirrhosis in whom you have excluded all other etiologies of altered mental status. So the common neurological findings, confusion, coma, asterixis, loss of fine motor skills, hyperreflexia, there are a multitude of uh, less common neurologic side effects list listed there. So it is, again, a diagnosis of exclusion. Minimal hepatic encephalopathy can affect up to 60% of cirrhotics. It's not so clear as overt hepatic encephalopathy. The patients may not actually even have altered mental status, but they can describe a lot of other things, diminished quality of life, uh, working uh, is more difficult for them, and impaired driving. It's more difficult to diagnose and frequently to diagnose minimal hepatic, encephalo hepatic encephalopathy. You need to do formal neuropsychologic testing. I found that the trail test is very helpful, and now they have the trail test on the iPad. Uh, you have the patient connect all the dots. The uh, uh, app will time them, give you a score and can, uh, you can use a medical student or your nurse as a control, and obviously this quantitates things. You can see the patient get better with treatment. So our treatments are the usual. We have the uh, nitrogenous uh, reducers, lactulose, the antibiotics, the ammonium binders. There are medicines that affect the neurotransmission. Obviously, if a patient has encephalopathy worsened after TIPS, Sometimes we have to occlude the tips. These are the approved drugs, lactulose, rifaximin. We use neomycin. Others have used flagyl and vancomycin, although these are not FDA approved, but these are all the treatments for hepatic encephalopathy. And finally, just to finish off, hepatocellular carcinoma, a significant global problem a significant problem in the United States. The problem is resection uh, is not a cure because uh, relapse can be as high as 50% at two years. And the other problem is that most patients with HCC are cirrhotic and we can't resect a cirrhotic patient. So here you go, liver cancer number two in the US following thyroid cancer. So it's important to screen, and this is kind of complicated. I just want to point out we should be screening with ultrasounds every six months. If you find a small lesion, less than a centimeter, the general recommendation is to follow it. But if you have a bigger lesion, at least one to two centimeters or larger, the important thing here is in this day and age, we can make the diagnosis of liver cancer now without the need for biopsy. You need to do dynamic imaging, looking for the characteristic uh, enhancing pattern of these lesions, and you can make the diagnosis based on that alone. Biopsy nowadays is really only required in people who have equivocal imaging. So that's the important take home message. So you diagnose the HCC, you want to find it at an early age, because if you find it at an early age, it's potentially curable. Once it's intermediate or advanced, treatment is just palliative. And if the patient has terminal stage disease, it's really just pain control. So I just want to end by saying,
This is what we should be looking for. We need to find the patients within Milan criteria or UCSF criteria because these are the early stage cancers which we can cure. Milan, one tumor less than five centimeters or up to three with the largest being three. UCSF, one tumor up to 6.5 or multiple tumors, the largest up to three, but total tumor burden less than eight. And the survival rates after transplant are listed there. So for cirrhosis, we need to be aggressive about treating cirrhosis to decrease the complications. Uh, transplant is the only true cure. Uh, cirrhosis, we should consider prospective medicine, treating to prevent problems. Ultimately, uh, we do have liver transplant. Thank you very much.